Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you uh, to applaud. But you know, I refereed for 25 years in the NBA. If you want to make me feel at home and comfortable, you should be booing and yelling and screaming at me. That's the environment that I'm used to. So I'm going to share an experience with you. Part of it you saw up there. In 1973, I followed in my father's footsteps and joined the New Jersey State Police. And that organization is steeped in deep military tradition. It was founded by a Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf, the father of the famed General H. Norman Schwarzkopf of the Gulf Wars. And I, as I graduated from that academy, I was assigned to different police stations. And when I got to my third police station, and all the state police stations were the same. It, we had a heck of a gig back then. We worked two days on and two days off. It was like firemen. You lived at the house. We were the local cops for towns that didn't have their own police department, as well as doing the miles and smiles on the highway, giving out the tickets and handing them the accidents. And I walked into the station one day after two days off, and they tried to make you feel good about yourself. They had the cubby hole that had your name on it as if that was your office. And I walked over, and it was a note to call Lieutenant Jack Liddy, Division Headquarters, Criminal Investigation Section, Organized Crime Bureau. This guy had more titles next to his name, and it wasn't common for a general road duty trooper to get a call from Division Headquarters. Folks, I grew up Irish Catholic. That means I wake up guilty in the morning. I thought I did something wrong. I thought I had a problem on my hands. The other trooper said, relax, kid, give the guy a call. He probably gave a ticket to a mod guy. I did. He said, you're going to be in for a while? I said, yes, sir. He came and spoke to me. And he said, are you interested in doing undercover work? I said, yes, sir. And he walked away. I said, Lieutenant, what is it? Drugs, narcotics? Because back then, all we were doing was buy bust on the street. He said, you keep asking a question, you're going to be able to run it. Over the next three weeks, I learned that the FBI, New Jersey State Police, were joining forces with the President's Organized Crime task force out of Washington, and we were going to start our own trucking company on the waterfront in New Jersey. I became one of those undercover guys. We started a trucking company called Mid-Atlantic Air Sea Transportation in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And the grant was written for six months. We had an aggressive mindset. We were going to end organized crime in the state of New Jersey in six months and move on to the next thing, I guess. <laughs> we learned very quickly that didn't happen. And what I was told to be six months of my life became three years of my life. And we started another trucking company in the shadows of the Statue of Liberty, a larger one, called Alamo Transportation. I became the president. An informant became the vice president. And the other trooper and FBI agents took on other roles. And we had a viable trucking company working for us. We had two new partners, the Genovese and Bruno crime families. And we're kicking back 25%. Our trucks are making three runs to everybody else's one run down on the Port of Newark. But I'm not here to talk to you about undercover work. But I need to lay the groundwork for the conversation that we're going to have. So I'm going to take you to the last day. The day that I thought was going to be the greatest day of my life, I come back from being undercover. I come back to being Bob Delaney. And what it became was probably the worst day of my life. For those of you who have ever been involved in something like this, you, you muster up at 3 in the morning. You have uniformed troopers, FBI agents, state police detectives, and they start going out and picking people up. And for us, it was at the West Orange Armory in West Orange, New Jersey. And as they started to bring them in, I got assigned to be with Sergeant Barry Lardier. He was in plain clothes, but he had the state police ID outside of his pocket. He said to me, you want to go downstairs and see what's going on? What he meant, the processing, where the fingerprinting, the pictures, shooting them off into the room, see who's going to be the next informant. And I said yes when I meant no, because now they're going to really know who I am. So that military bearing from the academy came back, and I put myself at parade rest. Got my shoulders back, eyes up, to look them in the eye. And when we got downstairs, one of the mob guys was being a fingerprint, and as the trooper put the handcuffs back on him, he looked over at me and said, Bobby, what they pinch you for? And before I could answer, Sergeant Lardier said, he's not pinched, he's with us, he's a trooper. The look that went between us was not one of anger. It was hurt and disappointment. He said, Bobby, how can you do that to us? How can you do it to me? I'm your friend. Freeze frame. Go back to St. Mary's Grammar School, Patterson, New Jersey. I was taught by the good sisters of St. Dominic. I got caught doing something wrong. Sister Joseph Rosier told me I was going to be punished. Before she told me what the punishment was, I said, Sister, Jimmy DeLolo is doing it too. I gave up my best friend in a heartbeat. <laughs> you know the ring that says they're married to God, the good sisters? Uh-uh, that's there to put welts on your head. She cracked me. She said, Delaney, you don't tell on your friends. It's an unwritten rule on a schoolyard. You don't tell on your friends. 
I went on an emotional roller coaster ride. And while people were trying to help me, and I, I was pushing them away because they were seeing behaviors in me that didn't make sense. And then Lou Free, who was a case agent and became the 15th director of the FBI, put me together with another undercover guy that had surfaced from doing his work. His name is Joe Pistone. You will know him as Donnie Brasco. And Joe and I, when we first talked, and I looked in his eyes and I heard his words, I knew he got what I was going through. And that was my introduction to peer-to-peer -peer therapy, peer-to-peer -peer conversation. One of the things to try to do is change words. So from peer-to-peer -peer therapy, we change it to peer-to-peer -to -peer conversation because in my view, post-traumatic stress is over-medicalized in our society. We scare people away from this conversation. Post-traumatic stress has been around forever. Sophocles wrote two plays about the warrior not knowing how to act after coming home from battle. After World War I, we called it shell shock. After World War II, we called it battle fatigue. After the Korean and Vietnam Wars, we called it flashbacks. Now we call it post-traumatic stress disorder. I change the terminology when talking to the men and women who serve us and call it operational stress because words matter. And the peer-to-peer -peer conversation is the first roadblock, our willingness to talk about what we feel, because what is personal is universal. If you're feeling it, I'm feeling it. There are no new emotions in this world. It's about how we navigate them. Folks, if I had a balloon in front of the room, how do I get the air out of the balloon? Yeah, I take a pin and pop it to get the air out. I let it go. It flies all over the room, goes out the door. We don't know what happened to the balloon. But if we're patient and willing to listen to sounds we do not want to hear, we let a little air at a time, it makes that awful noise. Eventually, we're going to get all the air out of the balloon. We're going to have a full balloon we can use again one day. That's us with trauma. We need to let the air out of our balloons. But what do we do? More often than not, we push down one on top of another on top of another. And if you take that analogy to its fruition, at some point, it's going to burst. So my hope is that in this conversation that we have today, that your appetite becomes wet to understand and become more knowledgeable about post-traumatic stress because we've done this in other areas. We've done it with HIV, AIDS, alcohol, drugs, tobacco. Education and awareness helps move the bar. Folks, you, you all remember the, the uh, show Andy Griffin? Yeah, 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 you saw it on Nickelodeon. I saw it live. <laughs> remember Otis the Drunk? That was a funny dude, Otis. I mean, he'd get drunk up on a Friday night, let himself into the cell, and then wake up in the morning and let himself out of the cell and go over and have breakfast with Andy and Barney. And we laughed at that until the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers helped us understand this is not behavior to laugh at. We move the bar in our society. We can do the same thing here. When you are willing to tell your story, you validate someone else's feelings. You give them permission to tell their stories, and it's a way for them to get the air out of the balloon. Confronting shadows is part of what we need to do. And folks, I say to people all the time, never be afraid of a shadow. Because if there's a shadow, that means there's light nearby. Our responsibilities to each other is to find that path to the light. So my hope for all of you is that you stay healthy, you stay safe, and you take care of one another. Thank you.